My motto, the title of, of my book is Let Patients Help. You'll notice, see, I'm a businessman who got sick. You know, some people who speak for the patient's way of looking at medicine are people who were harmed by medicine. Something bad happened. I was saved by the best of medicine. And yet, as I went through the process, I saw ways that medicine was not achieving its potential. My original industry, 30 years ago, was typesetting, of all things. You know, typesetting machines. And if you want to talk about an industry that changed, wow. You know, when fonts got out of the print shop and into your hand at home, we all have fonts on our computers now, most of us have fonts on our phones, the world that we in the typesetting industry knew started to come to pieces. It did not mean that everybody who had fonts was skilled. The same thing is happening in medicine now. People who have access to medical information sometimes do stupid things, but the new world is starting to grow up. And in the same way now that the documents that we produce with anything from Microsoft Word up to desktop publishing, they are more professional quality than they used to be, right? The same sort of thing is starting to happen in medicine. Um, I will, I want to say that I was in marketing, uh, so when I started blogging, I picked a nickname, which to me was a brand. I started a blog, uh, it was what, it was six years ago this month, six years ago this week actually, uh, I called it the new life of patient Dave. I didn't, I said, I don't know what I'm going to write about, but you know what, I was going to be dead by today, and I'm not, so I'm going to have a blog and I'll do anything I want with it. Then I, later, a couple of months later, I learned about the e-patient movement, and I just changed my name from Patient Dave to e-patient Dave, and I thought it would be my nickname on the internet, like Pirate Bob or Cowboy Bill or something. When Twitter came along, I knew about having a consistent brand, so I'm e-patient Dave. On Facebook, I'm e-patient Dave. On LinkedIn, I'm e-patient Dave. My website is epatientdave.com. And if you need to ask what my Skype name is, then you are no good at marketing. So, some things are complicated. Cancer is complicated, branding is not. How I came to be here. I worked in high-tech marketing, as I said, mostly in graphic arts. Uh, I am a data geek. I love data. I like to watch technical trends. I like automation. Uh, long ago, I wrote the world's fastest software for typesetting business cards. Now, that's a tiny market, you know? If you want to be the best at something, pick something tiny. So, what do we call it? Blue ocean, right? That's something nobody else does. Uh, and I love automation. In the typesetting business, when we automate, see, see, you might think that typesetting business cards is no big industry. But in the years of mergers and acquisitions, when one bank bought another one and 40,000 people needed new business cards, that was a huge market to be in. And one thing we learned was that the data had to be accurate. Because if the data and the software were not accurate, you would get high-speed garbage coming out of the printing press. Now, for the most part, medicine has not figured this out. Medicine is starting to get computerized, but as you'll hear later, there are many cases of wrong data in the computers, and that causes doctors and nurses and patients to do the wrong thing. We'll talk about that. 2007, I found out I was almost dead and I got better. I'm not exaggerating. 2008, I learned about the e-patient movement and started blogging about it. And in 2009, two things happened. First, a new Society for Participatory Medicine was formed. I'll talk about that later. And I started getting asked to give speeches. What happened there was amazing. I wrote a blog post about my medical record. And three days later, the Boston Globe, the big Boston newspaper, called and said, we think this is important. I said, what? They said, we want to write about it. And they didn't just write about it. They put it on the front page. And this was a week before our conference where I was giving a little eight-minute talk. And the next thing I knew, I was being invited to Washington to policy meetings. It was, people have said, it's like Alice in Wonderland. I'm falling down the rabbit hole. And I thought I was dying, but then I went, boom, and the, the lights came on and they handed me a microphone. So now I give speeches. You, know, you never know how the world is going to turn out. 
At any rate, in 2010, I decided that this is what I wanted to do. At the, at the end of my cancer, I felt like I was in a video game and it was going to say, game over. And instead it said, free replay. So I got to have a new game in life and this is what I'm doing. And in 2009, it became international. So this is the fourth European city I've been in this month, and uh, life is good, you know? It's great to be alive. I want to say also that I worked with data in business, so I understand the practical issues of taking a database and doing something with it. In fact, in 2008, uh, I got the, so there's a company called Salesforce.com that makes a big customer relationship management system. And I got their, uh, their national marketing award for marketing excellence using their data-oriented system. So uh, I know something about what happens when the data is accurate and when it's not. Two senior doctors at my hospital have been saying, in the case of Dr. Slack on your right, since the 1970s, that patients are the most underused resource. Now, they were talking about in information systems, technology. I assert that this is also true for all of medicine. Now, it raises a real important question, okay? I was saved by brilliant scientists who had incredible training that I don't have. I'm not saying that I know more than they do. And yet, there are many things that patients have can do without that training that add to what the doctors say. Now, these are doctors who are saying this. So the question to hold in your mind all day long is what can doctors, what can patients do that will add to what the doctors do? It's not just me who's saying this. The Institute of Medicine, which is the top of academic medicine uh, in America, published a report a year ago called Best Care at Lower Cost. And here's one of the things they said. For a, a continuously learning healthcare system, one of the th four things we need is patient-clinician partnerships. This means you and your doctor. It means your mother and her doctor. It means your children and their doctor as they become adults. They specifically said engaged, empowered patients. That's part of being an e-patient. I'll explain more about that. Now, and in fact, they said that the system should be anchored on patient needs and perspectives. This is the beginning of the end for paternal medicine because... The Institute of Medicine says that now medicine needs to look at things from the patient's point of view. It is no longer correct to say doctors know everything, doctors know best. Medicine needs now to start looking at things from the patient's point of view and promote the inclusion of patients and families as members of the team. Now that's background. Let's get to work. My foundation principles, first of all, patient is not a third person word. Every meeting I go to, scientific meeting, government meeting, people talk about patients as if it's the people riding bicycles out there, somebody else. I'm talking about the person who sits at your breakfast table every morning, okay? Because when disease hits, some of you I imagine have had this happen, when disease hits your family, the way you look at everything changes. And all of these points, by the way, are in the book uh, that you'll receive. Uh, your time will come when you understand this. My own doctor, who wrote part of my book, three weeks ago had a seizure. And for one week, he didn't know if he was dying, if he'd become an epileptic, if life had gone on. He looks at things differently now. He and I, we have a very close relationship. Sometimes we both speak together at conferences. Your time will come. Patients are the ultimate stakeholder. We have this word stakeholder. Usually it refers to companies. You know, but the, to me, the stakeholder is somebody who, you know, the saying is somebody has a stake in the outcome. Uh, the patients are the ultimate stakeholder, yet usually when you see a meeting that talks about all stakeholders, everyone is there except patients. And it all looks differently when you look at it from the patient's point of view. And then finally, what we're talking about here is social change. And there's always cultural resistance, you know, to a social change. So I've discovered that it's, 
It's very different when people talk about taking care of children and older family members. All right, so if you think about patient, parents taking care of a sick child, things look differently. Can you see okay through my, okay, thanks. Now this gentleman, Tom Ferguson, I never met him. He died in 2006 before I came along. He was a visionary. He, uh, in, he came out of Yale Medical School in 1978, and in those years, there was a, a publication, a sort of a Woodstock-era hippie publication called The Whole Earth Catalog, which is about how to build your own house, grow your own food, be responsible for your own life. Uh, and he was the medical editor in the 1980s. He wrote a magazine and then a book called Medical Self-Care. It was about how the, most of what we do to take care of ourselves is self-care at home, but he also knew that when you find yourself in trouble, I found I had kidney cancer, there's a big limit to how much we can do, which is how much information can we find, okay? And he saw that when the internet came along, that changed things dramatically. It didn't make us doctors, but it gave us access to information that we never had before. So that was one case 20 years ago when the world changed radically because of new information that people could get. And he started predicting things that would happen, and then he saw these people across the top who were doing it. This is Jill Friedman, uh, who started the ACOR, I'll explain more about them later, Network of Cancer Patient Communities. Next to him is Dr. Alan Green and his wife Cheryl. They started drgreen.com, the first physician website recognized by the American Medical Association. In the middle is Danny Sands, my primary physician. And he coined this term, e-patients, equipped, engaged, empowered, enabled. And you know, he, he was working on a multi-year project when he died in 2006, I'll say more about that. In 2009, that group of people decided the time had come to form a medical society. You'll notice that the, the emblem of the society is a handshake. This is about partnerships between doctors and their patients. There is too much work and too much information for doctors with all of their training to be responsible for everything. And they, that group decided that this medical society could not be run by only a doctor. It had to be a doctor and a patient. And to my amazement, they elected my doctor and me as chairman of the society. So I went from being almost dead in 2007 to being chairman of a medical society in 2009. It's a good trick. Some people said it's like jujitsu, where you use the energy of the attacker to propel yourself forward. Well, this magazine goes to hospital executives across the US, health leaders. They came and they interviewed my doctor and me and various other people. Much to our su surprise, they made this society a cover story. Now, this is important because if we had like a million dollars of funding and we hired a big public relations firm, we would have said, excellent, you got us a cover story, but we didn't. This was the editors of the magazine. Uh, and they got it right. They said, a new relationship. It's not about what patients do differently. It's not about what doctors do differently. It's about the balance, the rebalancing of the relationship. When my doctor gives talks about this, he has a picture of children on a seesaw, you know, rebalancing who's responsible for what. They came and took pictures of us, and they, they took pictures of me. I thought it would be the usual just picture of my head in a column of type. Honestly, I would have worn a different shirt if I'd known they were going to do this. You know, there I am, full page on the table of contents in an ugly Hawaiian shirt. But this is kind of their point that the patient of the future is a middle-aged guy with too much belly looking things up on the internet at home, all right? And in fact, every year they, they run an article on 20 people who make healthcare better. The first one that year was Atul Gawande, who's this famous and excellent surgeon who writes great books about surgical checklists and why costs are high in some place and low in others. He's a brilliant guy. 
excellent thinker, obviously one of the top people changing healthcare. Number two was Dean Kamen. His company invented the Segway scooter, and now they're making amazing robotic limbs for amputees. You know, like a knee that has computer sensors in it so it can tell when the ground is uneven. A real incredible innovation. Imagine my surprise when number three on the list was me in that stupid shirt. You know, that's like, guys, couldn't you have told me you were going to do this? We could take another picture, you know. But importantly, number four was Dr. Sands. Okay, so what they were saying was that this participatory medicine, this rebalancing of the partnership, belonged on the same page with Atul Gawande and Dean Kamen. Now, again, if I had said, you know what, I'm going to take over healthcare, uh, I would have been crazy. But I wasn't the one, I didn't apply for this. They said that this participatory medicine was changing the world. This was the time, late in 2009, when I started feeling like something was pulling me into a new career. But, you know, you're crazy if you jump off a cliff to start something new without some evidence. Anybody in business knows that. So I started examining, I mean, is, is what's happening to me any kind of indicator of the future? Well, so I looked for evidence from the past. Who's getting online? Well, I've been online since 1989, back on CompuServe, when you need to have a modem connected to your phone line, and you paid by the hour, and you paid more depending on how fast your modem was. In 2009, research from the Pew Research Center in Washington says that 76% of US adults were online. That's over 85% now. So by that one measure, what I was doing 20 years ago was an indicator of the future. One measure is not enough, though, so I looked for something else. Well, who's romancing online? I found my wife on the internet in 1999 on Match.com. Uh, it's funny, I'd been involved in a distance relationship with a woman in Florida, and when that ended, I looked on Match.com. Ginny was 13 miles away from me. So I was like, when I said, oh, I'm going on a date in a car with no airplane. This is great. Well, and a year later, I had to give a speech about data in Paris. So we got married, and we made, this, we made a honeymoon in Paris out of it. So that was 1999. In 2009, one in eight weddings in the US was people who met online. And now in 2011, it's one in five couples. What's possible for people to find what they're looking for has changed because the internet builds new connections. Now, there's an important point here. People say patients should stay off the internet because there's garbage on the internet. Well, I'll tell you, on Match.com, before I found Ginny, I went through some suboptimal search results. You know, people I would not want to marry, but I didn't marry the first one. And the research from Pew says that now, although people are Googling to find information about their disease, they do not stop at the first thing they find. Now, in the early days, they did, because we were not smart about it, exactly the same as when people first got their hands on fonts. They would do stupid things with them. But people are getting smarter. Now, I'm going to move into a little bit of my own story here, and there's much more about this on my website. I was an engaged, involved patient long before I ever knew the word e-patient. I had moved away from my doctor, Dr. Sands, for a few years. And when I came back, I said, let's get back together. I need an appointment for an annual physical, just a checkup. And before that meeting, I sent him an email with 12 things I wanted to review. Now, some people say, you sent your doctor an agenda in the email? How good is that? That's not proper. Well, in any other industry, if you're seeing a consultant, you know, you don't wait until you get there to discuss the agenda. And he says he was glad I did because he had several things he wanted to go over with me so he was able to think about how we will spend the time. Now, here's one item in that agenda and how it worked out. Think about this. A month before the appointment, I had a strange thing start happening in my right eye. Okay, a little sparkling pattern and... I tried to rub it away, but it didn't go away, and it started growing and growing, and I could see that it was shaped like a boomerang, a crescent, and then it got bigger and bigger, and in a half an hour, it was gone. 
And the first time that happened, I thought, whoa, flashback, you know, because I'm a child of the 60s, and I, I had some strange things like that happening uh, back in, when I was a hippie. Um, <laughs> but the second time it happened, exactly the same, I thought, what was that? Right? And the third time it happened, I started taking notes because I wanted to report accurately to my doctor what was happening. Now, we could have waited until the visit for me to start explaining it the way I just explained it to you, so he could start thinking then. But instead, I went out and I Googled. I spent two hours. It took me two hours to find a good, accurate description of it. Okay? And when I did, I pasted it into the email like this. I said, that's the picture. The picture from that website, that's exactly what it looked like. I gave him the URL, same as you would with a colleague. Hey, I found this, what do you think? Right? People say, patients should not diagnose themselves. Well, I wasn't diagnosing myself. Who am I to diagnose myself? But this was a website about ophthalmic migraine, so I pasted it in with a question mark. You see, I wasn't being the doctor, but I was doing everything in my power to communicate. Here's what's going on. What do you think? This is the, the characteristic of participatory medicine. It's the patient being involved and thinking and working and asking the expert, what do you think? Okay? Now, as it happens, we got this resolved before I even got to the doctor's office. Another thing I had happening was I had a stiff shoulder. Right? It wasn't really sore, it was just instead of reaching up like this, I wanted to do this. So I said, please get me an appointment. Well, I saw him on December 30th, 2006. And this is the point in the story where everything becomes crystal clear, multi-sensory memory. Sights, sounds, everything. So I, I saw him on December 30th and on January 2nd, uh, I had the I visited the shoulder doctor, and the next morning, 9 a.m. exactly, January 3rd, 2007, I was at work. I remember exactly what color blue the, the cubicle walls were. I remember what the desk looked like. I remember what the Sony telephone looked like when it rang. And I don't know what is the mechanism in the brain that makes it record things so perfectly when your life changes. Well, Dr. Sands said, um, Dave, the radiologist called me and I called up the image on my screen and I thought, I'd like to call up the image on my screen. Those days are coming. They're not here yet. And he said, Dave, your shoulder's going to be fine. It's just a rotator cuff problem. But there's something in your lung. And that shadow in the oval there is not supposed to be there. Uh, he said, we don't know what it is. It could be a scar from some old infection or something else, but we need to find out. Now, when your doctor says there's something in your lung, you start thinking, wait, did I just feel something? Is something supposed to hurt? Am I about to? Your mind starts going crazy. Uh, well, we talked, and uh, he said, I said, so you need me to get back in there? I mean, I was willing to just go get in the car right away. He said, I ordered a CAT scan. Call this number to make an appointment. Well, this is what we found. This is in the other lung. You know, a CAT scan is like slices of salami. You know, every slice is a little different. This was a golf ball sized tumor in the other lung. And turns out I had five tumors of different sizes in both lungs. So now we knew it wasn't a scar from some old infection. We knew it was some kind of cancer. Lung cancer doesn't look like this, which means it spread from somewhere else. So that's metastatic cancer and that's bad news. So it raised the question of where's this from? Uh, I had to go in for, and he said, usually something like this is from an abdominal organ. Um, the cancer grows and a little piece of it breaks off and starts circulating in the blood. Sooner or later, the heart pumps it into the lungs where it gets stuck and starts growing. Well, I had five tumors. We needed to know what kind of cancer it was, so I had an ultrasound got to do what most women have with, you know, the jelly on the belly and um, My wife came with me. She's a veterinarian. She, she knows I'm not a dog, but she's seen lots of ultrasounds. So what she saw, this is from a later MRI, it was kidney cancer. I had two primary tumors like that. 
One had already stuck out the front of the kidney and one had already broken through to outside the back of the kidney. So this had been growing for a long time. Kidney cancer is not good news. Most people, when the cancer has spread, most people die. Um, I went home, people say, stay off the internet, you'll scare yourself. Well, some people don't want to know, that's fine with me, but you know, the nurse who managed my case when I was getting treatment said different people have different appetites for information. Some people want to know a lot, some people don't. If you're going to be patient-centric, if you want to understand what patient centricity is, the first thing you have to understand is patients are different. Same as any other market, any other part of life. I wanted to know everything I could. First thing I did was go search, you know, and WebMD is not well respected by doctors. It's not as good as medical literature, but it's, the medical literature is not available to me. So I looked at what I could. Look what I saw. The prognosis for any progressing disease is poor. Almost all patients are incurable. Now, on Match.com, if I didn't like the first thing I found, I kept looking. Same thing here. And by the, but by the third page of Google search results, every single thing said, outlook is bleak. Prognosis is grim. And I'm thinking, what the heck? I don't even feel sick. You know, I was getting tired in the evening, but I was 56 years old. You know, I'd been slowly losing weight, but to me, that was good. My doctor had been telling me to lose weight. My appetite had been shrinking, but I just figured I was slowing down. All of those things counted against me, but I didn't know it at the time. Here's a diagram of the drug that I eventually got, a diagram from the drug's website. This, this is, they said, the standard, typical kidney cancer patient. Well, there's that thing in my lung. Totally by coincidence, that's me. In the left leg, there's another metastasis there in the bone. The first pain I had was six weeks later when my knee started hurting, and I said to people, I don't want this knee pain. I want to go back to where all I had was cancer. Well, be careful what you wish for, because in fact, in May of that year, I fainted in the bathroom and landed on that leg, and when I woke up, the, the thigh bone was shaped like this. Fortunately, I was in shock, so I had no pain. You know, if you're going to break your leg, go unconscious first, because by the time I woke up, I had no pain. By the time the shock wore off, the medics had given me morphine, and I was in an ambulance. Um, anyway, and by the way, I am repaired. That leg works perfectly now. I love good medicine. In the head, that shows a metastasis in the brain. Uh, mine is in the skull, so I'm a poster child. I have a moth-eaten area at the back of my skull now. And because I'm an overachiever, I have a, had additional metastases everywhere, including look at the head again. I had one growing out of my tongue muscle. By the time my treatment started, I had a kidney cancer tumor in my mouth. I was really sick, and by the time I scored my disease, I read that my median survival is 24 weeks. Now, for those who don't know statistics, that means that half the patients in my condition in the study that they reported were dead within five and a half months, dead within 24 weeks. I knew enough about statistics to know that the median doesn't tell the story for everyone. Half the patients lived longer, but this was an indication of how severe my disease was. And when you hear this about yourself, the end of life becomes very real and right in front of your face. I woke up at one o'clock that morning looking at the ceiling of my bedroom thinking, what am I doing sleeping? My life is ending. What do I want to get done before it's over? I remember thinking about my mother. My father's funeral had been a year and a half earlier. And I thought, I remembered her face as she buried her husband. I thought, what's she going to look like when she buries her son? You know, and I mean, I, I thought, hmm, let's see, that would be June 25th, would be 24 weeks. And maybe if I, will it be a fall day? Will, there, will the leaves be changing the last time I look out a window? This, and I'm, I'm going into this detail because I want you to understand how motivated a patient and family can be to do as much as they can 
when everything is on the line. I had to sit down with my daughter, my only child. She had just gotten out of college. It's hard to say something like this to your kid, to say, to say I might not be around long. And her boyfriend was with her, and at the end of the talk I said, but guys, we're going to deal with this. Don't get irrational. Don't, I, I said, I don't want you to get married too soon just so you can do it while dad's still alive. And after the shock then, you're left with the questions. Okay, so what are my options? The odds are bad, but what can I do? In my case, now I know some people just want to be taken care of. They say, I'm scared to death. Help me, help me, help me. Other people, that's fine with me. You know, we need to help those people. If I said, I want to get in, I want to do everything I can to help. Well, amazingly, my doctor, Dr. Sands, recommended a, a cancer community on the internet, acor.org, founded by Jill Friedman, the guy that I mentioned before. Uh, and so I joined that community. I knew how to participate in an online community from CompuServe. So I watched for a couple of days and then I posted my first message. Consider the information that I got back. Within two hours of my first message there, they came, the patients, this is not managed by doctors. The patients came back and said, this is an uncommon disease. Find a hospital that does a lot of cases because you need somebody who's got experience. There's no cure, but this stuff called high dosage interleukin-2 sometimes works. It usually doesn't, and they quoted the numbers from the literature, but when it does, about half the time, it's permanent. Here I am, seven years later, six and a half years later. The side effects are severe. They sometimes kill a patient, which is why you need to go find uh, a specialist hospital that does a lot of cases. My hospital does 100 cases a year, more than anyone else in the world. Don't let them give you any other medicine first because it reduces the chances that interleukin will work. And here are four doctors in your area who do it and their phone numbers. One of them happened to be at my hospital. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is useful information and it does not exist in the medical literature. It does not exist in the literature. If what you look at is limited to the literature, you will not hear this. This is the difference in, how, remember the Institute of Medicine said the patient's perspective. This is stuff that patients talk about that doctors and researchers are not trained to talk about. It does not replace the scientists, it adds to the scientists, okay? This is a major new source of value that exists in reality and some people realize it and are learning to work with it and other people don't. This is why you come to events like this to hear about these things. Next thing I did as an engaged patient is I looked at my hospital's what we call patient portal, you know, to see th this was all kinds of medical language that I didn't understand a lot of it. But you know what? People say patients don't understand this stuff. Well, I didn't just stop with myself. I asked my sister, who's a physical therapist. My wife's a veterinarian. She knows a lot of medical words. My best friend's brother is a doctor. So I asked, what does this mean? Sometimes I made mistakes. But you know what? I wanted to do everything I could instead of sitting back and saying, boy, I hope the doctors save me. Me being me, I told you I love data. Well, I got my tumor sizes out of there and started adding them up. Uh, and as the treatment began, the numbers reduced, which was great because what I'd learned both from the literature and from the patients is with interleukin, either you are a responder or you're not. So in my case, it worked out. And 50 weeks later, here is that same tumor shrunk. They never even cut me open to get at the lungs. I had surgery just to remove the kidney, but that was all. Interleukin is an immune system treatment that treats the whole body. Bones and everything were all cured uh, by this stuff. Now, mind you, the side effects were severe. At one, at one point, my blood pressure was down to 50 over 30. The walls of my capillaries had opened up. All the fluid had leaked out. My legs were swollen like water balloons. They stopped the treatment because they knew how to manage the side effects. Some patients die because the hospital is not enough of a specialist. Now, here's a question. None of this is anti-science, okay? I'm an MIT graduate. I understand the scientific method. How can it be 
that the most useful information could possibly exist outside of the medical literature. We are trained to think, trust the scientific literature because journal editors and the peer review process will control the quality. So how can it be that additional good information can exist? Well, Tom Ferguson, the founder of the e-patient movement, when he died, he was working on, uh, he was working on a, a research project for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a very good uh, ph philanthropy uh, in the US. And his colleagues finished it after his death. And this 120-page paper is a free download now on epatients.net. He talked to Donald Lindbergh, the director of our National Library of Medicine. Now, the National Library of Medicine collects all the medical journals in the world. It's a big place, you know? And Dr. Lindbergh said that when he was in medical school, he was told that a good doctor would go home every night and read two articles to keep up on his craft. Well, he said, if I did that today, after one year, I'd be 400 years behind. There's too much new literature being published. It's too much for anybody to keep up with. In fact, it turns out this number, people are always questioning this. It can't really be that bad. Well, it turns out that the number is now 1,100 years behind because there are 2,000 journal articles, 2,200 journal articles published every year, excuse me, every day. So if you read two a day, you'll fall behind by 1,000 to one, 1,100 to one. Now, consider also that the average physician, you know, in, in America we have condition codes, 10 to 11,000 different conditions that a doctor is supposed to keep up on. But in the kidney cancer patient community, we have one disease that we go deep and wide on. Okay, so there's this partnership. And what you see is, if the patient learns about a piece of research their doctor hasn't seen, they bring it to the doctor and say, hey, what do you think? Okay, the patient is involved in gathering information. The physician is still the trusted consultant, the expert. Then there's this thing that he called the lethal lag time. You know, the delay that will kill you. From the moment when a paper is published, or when a paper is, when the, the research is finished, until it gets published and has reached doctors. You know, they go through writing the article and circulating it for review. Two to five years. Now, if you have a median survival of 24 weeks, this is a problem. If you find out that your mother has just been told she has nine months to live, the idea that research might have been completed two years ago that hasn't reached your mother's doctor yet, it will turn you into an activated, engaged patient hunting for this information. Amazingly, the doctors who do this research are usually very happy to tell people about it before it's, been, uh, before it's been published. I know a woman who prolonged her own life 18 months by finding a researcher in a laboratory working on something that was never going to be published. It was, but you know, she was a breast cancer patient. They'd run through all the other treatments uh, and they found this thing that was not approved yet, but for her it worked in cooperation with her oncologist. Patients have all the time, believe me, I had nothing better to do with my time than look for kidney cancer treatments, you know? And we, we can't just turn around and tell all the doctors to read more. What's happened here, this is the thing that has changed that most people don't realize. This is a generic diagram of networks, but what I realize now is that in medicine, information is like a nutrient in the, in the, in the body. Uh, when it reaches a particular location, new things become possible there, all right? And what we now see is that these dotted lines of network connections uh, are like capillaries in the body, in the same way the capillaries carry blood and nutrients to all parts of the body. And this explains now why it's possible for something valuable to show up in an unexpected place when that was not possible 30 years ago. And then finally, Death by Googling. Ferguson wrote about death by Googling. Stay off the internet, you'll hurt yourself. You'll kill yourself. Well, Dr. Gunther Eisenbach in Germany, at the time 10 years ago, now he's in Toronto, uh, he looked for true stories of people who got stupid advice on the internet and died. And in a three-year search, he found zero 
Not a single case. He found plenty of people who got bad advice, plenty of people who had things that harmed them, but not a single one who died. And now you compare that. This says that the danger of patients looking on the internet is much lower than we thought. You compare that with the reality that this is a famous paper from our Institute of Medicine from 1999. That was 14 years ago. At least 98,000 deaths a year in US hospitals from accidents. And it turns out the number is more like four times that high now. And Ferguson made a great point. It may be more dangerous not to educate yourself okay, about your condition and find out. Do everything in your power to help your physicians. And he also said, this is important, these conclusions are no more anti-doctor than Copernicus was anti-astronomer when he said maybe this, the Earth is not the center of the solar system. Patients can simply contribute more today than in the past. I'm going to uh, uh, present a diagram from the Netherlands uh, that was, I don't think it's ever been published, but I got it from... Uh, uh, from uh, a slide presentation from Lucien Englund in Nijmegen, uh, if I can say that correctly. It's such a hard word. Americans cannot say that word correctly. What? Uh, I'm, I'm learning to say Radboud. Is that close? Yeah. Close? Okay. I'm doing what I can. You know, just like with fonts. I try to learn. You know? Anyway, in the old days, the medical institution contained all useful information and all surgical skills and access to medical libraries and so on. And all of that value was delivered through a one-way arrow to the patient, okay? This dotted line here is the dividing line between the institution and the patient. So this is what was called uh, Health 1.0. This is exactly similar, by the way, to the fact that 30 years ago in printing, Everything about printing, fonts, page layout, software, everything existed in a printing shop. And if you wanted any part of it, you had to go to a printing shop. Today, you can do your own page layout. Pieces of it have come apart. Now, in Health 2.0, the patient has come closer. The circles are still not identical, but now today, some patients bring real value to the table. Okay? And the world that they are looking forward to is where we're all swimming in a common pond of information. Remember, information is the nutrient that makes better outcomes possible. And they call that health 3.0 and 4.0. Now, in the web, you may remember that we have a big anniversary coming up. Next year, 2014, is the 20th anniversary of the web browser. 1994 was when the Mozilla browser was introduced. In those early days, the web was read-only. Somebody could publish a paper, you could read it, but you couldn't comment on it. You certainly couldn't write your own blog or anything like that. Well, and then Tim O'Reilly describes Web 2.0 as when the web began to harness the intelligence of its users. So what's on the web became something that was user-generated. Right now, Something people don't often talk about is it also harnessed the stupidity of its users. Because you have a whole lot of people saying stupid things on the internet too. So part of the work that we have to do is teach people how to filter gold from the garbage. Uh, what we now see is that the patient, it's not that patients got smarter, but they have access to a network now. Okay, so patients have access to information that didn't exist before. And in fact, all these people, the professionals and everyone, have access to information. This is how the world has changed. In Cincinnati, Ohio, there's something called the C3N Project at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, Collaborative Chronic Care Network. They're doing remarkable things by, by giving the patients and families tools to figure out what they want to do in managing a chronic condition. And one of their doctors, a doctor named Michael Side, at a conference in California in September showed this great graphic that illustrates this point. It's from Wikipedia. See this? This explains, this illustrates how a whole bunch of little fish together might be able to gobble up the big fish. And this is how uh, you know, in a less predatory sense, uh, a whole bunch of patients might have more information together than the doctor has. Now, if the doctor is open 
to learning about this, then good new things can happen. We have this thing called paternalism, paternalistic caring. At medical conferences, I always hear about people, to even, even doctors, saying paternalism is a bad thing. Well, happily, after my cancer, I survived to see the birth of my granddaughter this summer. Uh, what a wonderful experience. Well, you know, when she goes for a ride in the car, she has no idea how she should be taken care of. So her parents put her in a car seat, facing backwards in the back seat of the car, because she can't understand. She doesn't know what she needs. The paternalistic response is, I'll take care of you. I'll decide for you. But there will come a time where they ask her, Zoe, where do you want to go today? Do you want to go to a movie? Do you want to go to the beach? And there will come a time when she's driving the car. The art of good parenting is to understand when the person you are taking care of becomes able to do some things on their own. And you help them learn. This is the change that we're going through, that we're beginning to manage. Now, we, there's this question of empowerment. What is empowerment? I found, a, after several years of talking about this, uh, I found a great definition uh, a couple of months ago. It was at a Parkinson's disease conference in Montreal. Empowerment is the process of increasing the capacity you know, the ability of individuals or groups to make choices. I remember in college in Boston in the 1960s in the women's movement, women's empowerment involved one of the first things was teaching women that they had the right to make choices um, and teaching men that they should listen to women's choices. So this is one thing, to make choices and then to transform those choices into actions and outcomes. Now it turns out this is a definition of empowerment from the poverty movement. It's used in going into villages in poor parts of the world and developing those people's capacity to make choices and convert that into actions so that their life in that village can improve but it applies perfectly to patient empowerment also. And here's a key thing. Nobody, a patient or a scientist or anyone, can possibly perform to the top of their potential if they don't have the information. So if patients don't have access to information, we have no idea what they could do to produce value. But it applies to physicians and nurses also. A doctor or a nurse, if they're given wrong information, they cannot possibly perform to the top of their ability. Here's a great example from my own life. Two years ago, my mother had an operation. She had a hip replacement. Everything went well in the hospital, but then she was transferred to a rehab, rehabilitation facility. When they did that, they didn't have computerized medical records. So they had to print everything out and then type it into the new computer. Well, in typesetting, we know what happens when you retype a bunch of information. Typos, typographical errors. Well, my mother's hyperthyroid was typed wrong as hypothyroid, the opposite condition. Here's the thing, the best doctor in the world looking at the wrong information would have prescribed medication that could have killed her. The quality of the information is essential. All right, so the problem is, what are you going to do? You know, in typesetting, we have proofreaders. Somebody types it and then somebody else proofreads it. Can you imagine how hospitals would slow down if they called in a proofreader every time something was typed into a hospital computer? I say, let patients help. In this case, my sister, my sister who manages my mother's care was there. She said, can I check the information? And the hospital said, yes. And my sister caught the problem before it killed my mother. Now, the hospitals you work with, will they allow patients to check all the information? I say they should. Here's another problem. This, is, this gets into the technology view of things. What if the information exists in the world but doesn't arrive at the point where it's needed? This is Tom Ferguson's lethal lag time. What if the information is out there but hasn't reached the point? Here's a study from our Institute of Medicine from back in 2000. I've, I've often heard people say it takes 17 years for doctors to start following new advice. 17 years, wow. 
Uh, so I found that it comes from this. The flu vaccination study was published in 1968. 32 years later, only 55% of doctors were following the new research. Half of doctors. All right, beta blockers for cardiac patients after a heart attack. 18 years later, only 62% were following the new standard. Now, if this scares you, it probably should. I mean, it says wake up, you know. Um, the problem is that there is nothing in place that guarantees that every doctor will learn everything new. It makes all the sense in the world for every patient to understand what they can. The new standards for diabetic foot care, seven years later, only 20% of doctors were doing it. Now, it turns out that this point is exactly on a long-term historical curve. Some people read this and they want to go yell and burn hospitals down and complain, but it's part of a trend of history. Microsoft Research published this book a few years ago called The Fourth Paradigm, and it's the history of new medical discoveries this is the year of the discovery and how long it took to become widely used, going back to a 1,000 years before Christ. So, for instance, the quarantine was first discovered in around the year 900, and it took 700 years for it to be widely used. Information did not move around quickly then. Scurvy, you know, this condition that killed sailors uh, in the Navy that could be cured just by eating citrus fruits, well, that was discovered a little bit after 1500. It took 264 years for that life-saving information to spread throughout the British Empire. Isn't that amazing? So that's getting closer. Now you look at the most recent part of this here, and it turns out, so Semmelweis, the, the doctor who discovered that fewer mothers died if the doctor washed hands between patients, that took 50 years to become widely used. H. pylori, that's the bacteria that causes stomach ulcers, was discovered in 1985, and that took 20 years before it was widely accepted. And you'll notice that we are approaching the point within the lifetime of some people in this room where dissemination of new knowledge, the spread of new knowledge, will be almost instant. I'm willing to bet that that will happen first among doctors under the age of 30, that most people my age still think that if you want to know the best advice, go look in a book. <clears throat> Does not work that way. You know, a doctor at one conference said something, and this is very challenging to some people, you know, because if you were trained, be responsible, go look in a trusted book. Well, the world has changed now, you know. Well, a doctor at one conference uh, I spoke at recently said, you're a fool if you don't start with Wikipedia but you're crazy if you stop there. Now just imagine, you know, if, if a famous musician died yesterday or even today, if you wanna know how they died, you go look at Wikipedia because it's there within hours. Similar things happen in medicine, but you always have to be responsible for what if that information is wrong? So you don't stop there, okay? Now I'm gonna talk about a concept from technology, from the computer business, uh, I think it will be understandable. I've just been using this idea for the last month or so. Liquidity, and I'll explain what I mean. It transforms what's possible because it alters the availability of a vital resource. I'll show you what I mean by this. This is not liquid, coal in a train. This is liquid, water running through the woods in a stream. Perhaps this is a flood where there's water where there's never been water. Well, something that's not liquid, moving takes effort. You, know, you have to do some work to get it to move. It's slow and predictable. You know, you know where the train tracks are. This is very similar to the pathway of information coming through a medical journal. Unexplained arrivals are suspicious. You know, if you go to work one morning and all of a sudden there's a coal car outside your window that you didn't expect, it's suspicious. Well, with liquid, Controlling the flow takes effort. Imagine you spill a bowl of sugar, the sugar stays right there. You spill a glass of water, it, it takes effort to control it. It's fast and unpredictable, and there are tracks everywhere. Basically, there are no more tracks. Information can move anywhere. And what we now see is that this is exactly what was happening here, okay, in, uh, in England's diagram. Um, 
where here the information moved in a predictable way in one direction, and now it's starting to move like this, where we're all swimming in a common pond of information. And for those of you who like to talk to management consultants, this is illustrated by a report that comes out every year from Deloitte called the Shift Index. They're following five major trends that are changing all of life, not just medicine. They have the, this one great quote, um, we're shifting from a world where the key source of strategic advantage was to protect and extract value from a set of knowledge stores, okay? So you have these, th this pile of information that you have and other people don't. And that is value to you and you sell it to them or you know things that they don't. We're switching from this world to a world where the focus of creating value is to participate in the flow. This is a whole different set of skills. If you know this is going on, you can, this is why everybody better be involved in social media. Because if you're on Twitter, for instance, you know within hours things that are happening in your field of interest. I've talked to people who didn't know months later that something important had happened that Twitter had been talking about. And this was stated by Thomas Friedman, who's won three Pulitzer Prizes for his work in economics. Okay, and the economics has a lot to do with where value is. At this point, I'd like to stop. I've been talking for almost an hour. Are there any questions you'd like to ask? I, can, I have a lot more to, I could keep talking, but anybody want to get up and move around a little bit? I'm, or I can just keep forging ahead. What would you like? Any questions? Anybody want to call me crazy? Say you're nuts because, you know, like any good scientist, I'm prepared to be challenged. It's, but if your doctors refuse to be challenged, they are not good scientists. Sorry to say it. Um, and yet, I've had people say, I'm the doctor. When did you go to medical school? Uh, yes. <laughs> Apart from Holland, where do you think, uh, uh, in which medical or social uh, setting is this message landing at its best? So I think you, uh, I, I think actually there's no clear answer because you're talking about one segmenting by country and there are actually different segments going in a whole different dimension. And, and you know, where you have activated patients where you have consumers, this is the birth of a consumer movement, and I don't just mean in the money sense, but you know, it used to be that all power was in the institution and now it's not. Where you have activated consumers speaking up and where you have doctors and companies listening to them, the new thing is emerging. And usually because medicine is complicated, it's in different ways in different countries. I was telling some people earlier, for instance, that Denmark has a universal medical record. You go into a hospital anywhere in Denmark and they'll have your complete record. You know, and that prevents you know, information failures in a lot of ways. But the patient is still not allowed to say, hey, that's wrong in the record. I didn't have my left arm amputated or something like that. You know, or I, I don't have that medication. And the patient's there. They love the fact that the record is there, but they're saying, you idiots, what will it take to get you to listen to me? You know, there are parts of America where th there are some hospitals that are really, really thinking about how can I create a better experience for my patients. Uh, and it, amazingly, when patients see more information and are listened to, they get more involved and they take a better part in it. But there are other parts of America that are the exact opposite. Get back in your cave, stupid patient is pretty much it. So I say don't be stopped by the answer to that question. Just go ahead and see the future and start moving there so you get there before other people do. Yes, another question. Yes. Do you have any, can you elaborate on what, what patient engagement, what that would mean for healthcare costs? Because well, you can think in the beginning, you think it could be more expensive because it will cost more doctor time. <coughs> but maybe there's a total other, other outcome. You know, the, so it's important. The, whenever a change starts in a stable system, 
there's the problem that you start to move away from what they call the local minimum. You know, you always have to climb out of the valley. But that's why it's important to hold the vision of what if we only did things that, and in fact, later in my talk, I'll get to my own experience. What if we only did things that patients actually said they wanted? You know, over the last hundred years, there have been so many medical advances. Ah, we have a new way to, to cure this, a new way to treat that, and so on. For a long time, we assumed that every new invention was something people would want. But now we're getting to the point where people are saying, wait a minute. I mean, so I'll give you a quick example. Because I give a lot of speeches, two years ago, I gave a speech in Washington where my face was on a big TV screen. Okay, afterwards, a doctor came up and said, that thing on your cheek, you should have it looked at. Well, thank you, you know. But it turns out it was a skin cancer. Now, on the American system, because I had cancer before, I cannot get regular commercial insurance. Thank you. Ugh. So I had, to, I had to go in what we call the high-risk insurance group. This is ending with Obamacare, but I ended up buying what we call high-deductible insurance. You know, the first $10,000 of payment came out of my pocket. So I said, okay, I have to have this skin cancer taken off. What will it cost? My hospital said, we don't know. All right? They said, ask your insurance company. The insurance company, I'm not kidding, said, we don't know, ask your hospital. All right? And now people turn around and say, why can't patients act like good consumers? You know, there was a guy who gave a TED talk, a TED Med, two, a year and a half ago. He said, why don't patients act like consumers? Patients spend 10 times more time researching a television than they do a treatment decision. And I wanted to strangle the guy the reason we spend time researching televisions is because there's lots of information. Now, so I say it's perverted to keep people away from information and then call them stupid. You know, that's one. So anyway, remind me of what your original question was, because I. Uh, so all right, so it's when. A short answer on that is in the field of shared decision making. Okay, for instance, on, on prostate treatments, uh, treatment for prostate cancer and so on, there's years of research that shows when people are given enough information and time to consider it, they choose less invasive treatments that cost less. All right, and they're, because they're involved in the decision, they tend to like the outcome better. So there you have more satisfaction at a lower cost. But it takes something to get over that hump. That's why it's so important to see the vision and then work together to get through the change. Is that, so was there another question here? Yes, and then I'll move on. Sorry, um, I was wondering how you see the role of pharmaceutical industries in this health uh, 3.0 or 4.0 because we would like to engage more with patients yes. but Due to compliance compared to, let's say, the U.S., we are not allowed to do uh, such a thing. I know, I know, I hate it. Ah, oh, that's uh, really. I mean, the word that comes to mind, to, and I don't know if you'll recognize this word. It, this word, it's Yiddish. The word is oi. You know, it's so difficult. You know, when you're paralyzed from doing what patients want. Not only that, but the. I mean, I I receive treatment in a clinical trial. Now, and I know lots of people who are involved in clinical trials. The whole business model of large-scale clinical trials is falling apart, you know, as we get into subtyping of diseases. First, it's harder to find enough patients to do a big trial. And then if you succeed, the market has shrunk. So I, I would guarantee, one of the few things I would guarantee about the future of pharma is that some years from now, 5, 10, 20, I don't know, it's going to go away from the idea that we can find one answer that has good predictability and go more into you know, what in Silicon Valley they call iterative development. You try something with one patient and see how it works one by one. In the meantime, pharma, I think, has a hard road ahead of it uh, and again, the thing to do is keep, the, keep the, the vision on it. This is why it's so important for everybody involved in this to work with policy people also. You know, the European uh, Cancer Patients Coalition uh, places a high value on getting involved in policy at the very beginning of the process. It's because if the patient's perspective 
is not baked into the policy from the very beginning. It's very hard to add it on afterwards. So that's, I, that's why I'm so glad that so many different parts of the industry are here for this conversation. We, um, when you're changing culture, you have to involve everyone. Let's see. Now, here's a big problem. Everybody says, well, patients don't understand this stuff. I know that. When I looked at my medical record, one of my CAT scans, I didn't understand the word craniocaudal. And because I didn't understand that word, uh, I misunderstood a number and all of that. So people say, we have big problems with health literacy. Well, I propose that this is thinking about it wrong. All right? If we want patients to be active partners, we should not think of it as health literacy, but health clarity. Let me show you what I mean by this. See, in the typesetting industry, in the last years of the typesetting industry, we believed, as medicine does, that the, that the way to produce better value is to come up with more and more powerful things. Well, the more powerful things become, the harder they can be to understand. And so I, I actually, I was in a board meeting once at my company where the director of engineering said to the board of directors, this is a powerful system. Our only problem is that marketing can't find customers who are smart enough to use it. Really? Well, that's wonderful. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I mean, you may have heard discussions like this. You know, websites. Today, you know, you might remember 15 years ago, many websites were really hard to figure out. All those websites are gone now because people figured out if you want someone to stay on your website, you have to make it easy to use. The same thing is coming to medicine. Let's make it clear like other industries do. Look at this. Thomas Getz, uh, this is blurry. It's his personal medical information. You're not supposed to be able to read it. He was the executive editor of Wired Magazine. And he, he had some lab work done on his blood. And he got this page of stupid numbers. I'm sure you've seen something like this. And he thought, you know, this is ridiculous. This is what a financial report used to look like back in the 1980s, just rows of numbers. And the financial analysts would say, this is why consumers can't understand this. This is why you need financial analysts. Well, today, financial analysts compete for your business based on how good their pie charts and their graphs are to help you understand, all right? So he said to his art department, can you make this look like an investment report? And they came back with this, green for good value, Red for bad value, here's where you are. Green for good value, here, red for bad value, here's where you are. It's the same information, the same data, displayed with better software. All right, now imagine all of that medical information that's out there, hard for you or anyone else to understand, being displayed that way. The information buried in the data becomes clearer, and the same consumer or patient becomes informed and enabled. In information theory, I gave a talk at an information theory conference in Washington uh, on Sunday. There's this model, this hierarchy of data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. This is the bits and bytes, the raw numbers that were on that gray page of numbers. Information is what it all means, all right? And that's what was displayed there. Here's another great example. Before I gave my very first talk at a medical conference, I wanted to understand what is this psoas muscle. So I had a tumor coming out the back of my kidney, and the report said it was touching the psoas muscle. It turns out the psoas muscle is a big muscle that goes from the spine to your leg. So when you lift your leg like this, it's the psoas muscle that's lifting it, but I'd never heard of it. So I found this website, visiblebody.com, where you can just click and remove things. I said, oh, there's the psoas muscle. I can see how a tumor coming out of there would touch the psoas muscle. And I was rotating it in 3D. And because I work in high tech, I'm accustomed to taking one kind of information and another piece of software, combining them. You know, we call it mashups. So for instance, you take global positioning satellites combine it with mapping software, and combine that with root finding software that works on maps, and all of a sudden, your phone becomes a navigation device. Crazy. Even though the satellites were put in space without knowing about it, and the root finding software never thought it would be used in a telephone, for heaven's sake. 
Well, so I thought, wow, I'm rotating this. I thought, what if we combined that with my digital CAT scan? Remember those pictures of my CAT scan? I could have Google Earth for my body. And I could be looking at my tumors in my body. Well, let me introduce you to a piece of software called Osirix. And let me see. Oh, good. It is open. So there is, let me see if it will behave properly. Running with multiple monitors is always fun. So this is the slices of the salami. This is my CAT scan that you saw earlier. So there's that tumor. And if I go down here further, see there's the, there's the golf ball sized tumor over there. And as I was exploring with this, because I need to make different screen captures for this, I can't really tell. The, the big things are obviously tumors, but the other dots, they're like cross sections of blood vessels. I can't really tell what's happening. But then I noticed that over on the menu, there's something called 3D Viewer. And I thought, what the heck is this? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it put the slices back together. So that's me. And if I run this slider, it shows you my muscles and then my bones. So those are my ribs. And if I get the contrast just right, look, there's my tumor. And over on the right side, well, and then I'll use this bone removal tool. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> and let's see, adjust the contrast a little bit. There's that tumor floating in my lungs. Over here, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, oh, I'm poking the wrong button here. See, I'm not good at this, and I'm still doing things. There's another tumor over there. The contrast is better on my screen. And the thing that I really love is that if I run this slider again, it puts the meat back on my bones, comes all the way out. Those are buttons. That's my shirt. I had a piece of paper in my pocket when I got that CAT scan. That is information that was buried in the black and white data. With software interpreting the information, it makes it easier for you and me to understand what was in there. And amazingly, this is open source software. So any software developer can take this and put it into their personal health tools. Uh, there is a $1,000 professional version of this. But this is the free consumer version that anyone with a Mac can download. It doesn't work on Windows. It uses the Linux operating system. But this puts power in the hands of people who want to understand. We can, I can show you more about this if you want, but the, um, let's see, I need to, uh, how are we doing on time? Another 25 minutes? Okay, good. Anytime you want, break in with questions because, let's see, I have to get into the correct, oh, how do I get back to the presentation here? No, oh, I'll, I'll do it. All right. Yeah. I'll come back over here. Yep. Come back over to mine. There we go. Good. So Google Earth for my body. Lesson learned. Clarity is power. In the book, by the way, all of these concepts are explained. One of the chapters is titled Clarity is Power. Since I'm a marketing guy, I like to take complicated subjects and make them into little slogans that you could put in an ad. Another good example of this uh, is money. I was uh, talking with people about this. I know the American financial system is vastly different um, from the Dutch one, but it turns out there's a lot of parallels also. So when I went on what we call high deductible insurance, right, I had a CAT scan, and we'd, we have this wonderful document we get from our insurance company called an EOB, Explanation of Benefits. So after they pay a bill, they send you something. So I got a CAT scan. And here is a close-up of it. I know you can't read it from there. That's fine. Um, notice it says, this is not a bill. This is an explanation. $1,736 out of my pocket was what I paid for this CAT scan out of a total of $2,631 uh, because there was a negotiated discount secret agreement between the insurance company and the hospital. Um, all 15 items on the bill were described to me with the single word hospital. 
There was no discussion of what they were for. So if I wanted to shop for a better deal someplace else, guess what? No can do. Um, and in fact, I said, our government should prohibit calling something an explanation if nobody can understand it, you know? Uh, now, 2012, I went to shop for my next scan. So this was 2007, 2008. Year four, four years out, so I wanted to know, okay, which CAT scan businesses have the best resolution? I want a good quality picture, because I like to look at it in my computer, and I figure my doctors probably want good quality. Who has the best location? Who has the best hours? So if I want to get a CAT scan in the evening, I can do that. Who has the best price? Who has the best service? There's no way to find out. All right, so now we wonder, all right, so, you know, if somebody is empowered, if empowerment is increasing somebody's capacity to make choices, then this is disempowering if there's no way for me to get answers to my questions, right? And it's all because the information is hidden from the people who have the most at stake. In fact, here's my favorite complaint. Um, I, I talked about this uh, a few minutes ago. So one of our magazines, actually the same one that had the article about me, Health Leaders Magazine, said patients are the only ones who don't have any skin in the game. You know, this wonderful, um, this, this wonderful expression that means that if things don't go well, they hurt. Well, this was a medical office manager saying, if we do things poorly, the government punishes us, right? They take money away from us. Patients, if they do things poorly, the government doesn't take money away from them. Well, so when I got this skin cancer diagnosis, this is from my blog, um, I went out and I asked, how much is this gonna cost? And everybody said, we don't know. So I published an RFP, a request for proposals. When everybody said, it's gonna come out of my pocket and everybody says, we don't know what it's gonna cost. Well, so now this is the big, some people say, nobody acts like you, Dave. Well, remember, I was on the internet in 1989 on CompuServe, I found my wife on Matches, so watch for the future. And in this, importantly, I said, I seek a care partner to remove this carcinoma and so on. Uh, in edu I'm educating myself about the condition, I'm shopping for a partner to do the work and follow up with a good combination of quality, partnership, and cost. So I was acting like an empowered consumer. I want one of these, I want one of these. All right, the introduction in this, you can read this, it's online. Go to my website and just search for RFP on epatientdave.com. Introduction, partnership. The context for this exercise is responsible partnership, and on and on and on. Now, of course, I didn't get any normal responses, because what doctor's office has an RFP response sales team? All right? <laughs> but I got a lot of discussion on the blog. All right, now, you know, when a problem hits you, your family, you may start thinking differently. I got a lot of discussion about different options. So then, since no hospitals, by the way, one hospital came back and said, I've got a proposal for you. How about we do the surgery and you give us a free speech for grand rounds? <laughs> well, it was nowhere near my home, uh, so I said no, but I, I also, uh, I said, you know, I really, I, I can't do that. It might be nice to get the celebrity blogger discount, you know, get free surgery, but the whole purpose here is to find out. People say patients make lousy consumers. Well, what happens when a patient tries to be responsible? Well, I ended up calling three hospitals. It took me two months of all the spare time because uh, I had this, like I would call the dermatology department and say, so everybody said the best thing is this thing called Mohs surgery. They shave off a little bit and look at it under the microscope, shave off a little bit more until they know they got it all. But I said, what will that cost? And they said, we don't know. So I, then I started speaking their language. I said, okay, what billing codes will you send to the insurance company? And then they understood. Oh, well, we'll send a 17311. Oh, well, what do you charge for that? Oh, that's $2,000, and then um, 17312 and 12051 for stitching it up afterwards. And by the time I went through over and over and over again, I was surprised to see that they used different codes. You know? And of course, if this had been an emergency, I wouldn't have had time to do this. 
but skin cancer is not going to kill you quickly. It, basal cell carcinoma doesn't kill you. It all worked out that all three of them, $6,800, $6,600, $7,100. So I chose the one that was closest to home. Well, then a dermatologist on my website came up and said, well, you know, before there was Mohs surgery, we would just cut it out. You know, we wouldn't shave off pieces very carefully. Um, you know, if it's, since it's right on your face and you can easily watch it, you might want to do that. So I went back and talked to them all. Nobody had said there was an alternative, but it turns out that this just cutting it out cost $1,000 to $1,200. Really? That's a big difference. Now, it's important here. I, was, I said on the RFP, I am not going to decide based on price. I'm going to decide based on a combination of cost and value on what's important to me. And they uh, then, when I got to the hospital that I chose, I ended up choosing the one that was closest to home. The guy said, well, you know, if you're concerned about price, we could just do this other thing called ED and C, uh, electrodesiccation and curatage. I don't know. It's an electric needle that goes, that's the end of that. You have to watch to see if it will come back. So if the skin cancer was in the middle of your back, you wouldn't want to do this. But right here on your face, you'll see it right away. And I chose to do that. It took 15 minutes. And I cost, it cost me $680 instead of $6,800. Now, I'm not saying that the purpose here is to spend 90% less. But the, the point is, if consumers don't have the information, we have no idea what their choice might be, you know? And, you know, and it's, if it were my daughter and it were a different kind of condition, I might choose to get the best thing possible regardless of price, but without the information, you'll never know. Well, meanwhile, at TEDMED in 2012 in Washington, D.C., this doctor said, why don't patients behave like consumers? I wanted to strangle him. You know, like, sir, have you ever tried to find out what something is going to cost? In fact, he's the chief medical officer for a laboratory company called Quest Diagnostics. When I was shopping for different prices for a CAT scan, I, uh, for the blood work, I shopped, I called his company and said, what will it cost me to get the lab work done there? And you know what they told me? We don't know. His company, right? So I wanted to have a talk with him. I ended up never meeting him. Now, here's a big thing to think about if you want to be concerned about the future of medicine. This is a slide from a guy named John Moore at MIT's Media Lab. This summer, I saw his thesis defense. Uh, he said, we have this problem, this chronic disease epidemic. You know, somewhere in the 20th century, we got to where it used to be that most of the money we spent, most of our effort in medicine, uh, was on acu acute illness, things like my kidney cancer, right? And, but now, most of what we're doing is on, uh, is, is on chronic disease. Now, I looked at this and I thought, this is a problem? I'm alive because my acute illness got cleared up. I'm very happy to live to be old enough to have chronic conditions. I'm starting with high blood pressure. Maybe someday I'll have heart failure and so on. In fact, this is a college classmate of mine uh, who posted on Facebook in September that he's going to have a pacemaker put in. And the reason he's alive to have a pacemaker put in is because twice in the last 10 years, he didn't die from a problem he was having. Medicine saved him. So now he's living long enough to have chronic conditions. Think what this means for the future of medicine. People getting older and living constantly with chronic conditions. We have to give them tools for the home to manage themselves or the hospital system will be crushed. Some people think that if we put too much capability in patients' hands, nobody will need doctors in hospitals. Are you kidding? We're gonna have a huge number of people. In fact, get this, in March, a surgeon posted in general surgery news, more than half of all the humans who have ever lived to age 65 are alive today. More than half. That's easier to believe if you consider that at the end of World War II, we had 2.3 billion humans. Today, we have more than three times that many. Uh, and in fact, in 1935, when the American Social Security Bill was enacted, you know, this is the old age pension bill. 
is it dry in here or is it just me? I guess there are more people. You're welcome to join me in a drink. The median life expectancy in 1935, the median life expectancy was my current age, 63 and a half. That means that half the people who were born in my year, 1950, would have been dead by my age. Half the kids I went to school with would be dead. And believe me, that's nowhere near true. Far more of us are living to old age. So the future now is an increasing population of people who need to self-manage and care for chronic conditions. Well, this is how this all unfolded. I'm bringing it to a conclusion now. Uh, how in my life, this is a picture of me on the day of that physical in December of 2006. Uh, and this is a man who was dying of kidney cancer and didn't know it. At the time, I just felt tired. But you, know, you look at that, and that looks like somebody who's dying. Um, you know, we have this, this, uh, this holiday uh, in October, Halloween. You know, ghosts coming out of the graveyard. Well, at the office, I was diagnosed in January. My kidney was taken out in March. My treatment started in April and ended in July. My last drop of treatment was on July 23rd, six months after my diagnosis. I haven't had anything since then. Some people think that patient empowerment is anti-medicine. Are you kidding? I'm alive, you know? Anyway, at the office Halloween party that year, somebody took this picture of me grinning at the ghoul coming out of the, out of the grave. I had pictured my mother's face at my funeral. Uh, instead, in 2009, here we were laughing on the day when I did get to walk my daughter down the aisle and marry that young man. And it was, I was so glad that she didn't have to say to her mother, I wish dad could have been here. You know, and this is the difference that great health care makes. Well, at Christmas time, she gave me a jigsaw puzzle uh, you know, that's one of these websites where you can send them a photo and they'll make a puzzle or they'll put it on a coffee mug or anything. It was a really difficult jigsaw puzzle because it was an ultrasound. This was her way of telling me that she was pregnant. And in July, I got to meet this little girl and four days later I held her on my chest. I am so glad that medicine works as well as it does. It's just wonderful to be alive. And I so much want patients to be able to do everything they can to help make medicine, the business side, the clinical side, the research side, more effective. That's why the book is titled, Let Patients Help Heal Healthcare. Thank you so much and we have some time for some more discussion as well. Thank you. Questions, or, or do we break early for lunch? Perfectly, perfectly acceptable to be finished early. Yes. Um, is it on? Yes. Is it on? Yes. Um, well, it's clear that you're an engaged patient, um, but uh, I think that impactful e events could mean a lot in terms of change of behavior in people's lives. Uh, although that when we look at healthcare costs, we know that a lot of costs involve, and you mentioned already, the people with chronic diseases. And you know that, um, while well, we're here in a room with people that are highly educated, uh, many people don't have that education. And I think a lot of people nowadays are on the internet, especially in the Netherlands, but we know that change in behavior is very difficult, and especially in, well, certain groups that do go to the on the internet but i think more for the games and less for uh well the search for uh, uh information with regards to their diseases so what do you think uh what what should we do to to motivate those groups so a couple of things first of all it's an exactly appropriate question and while i get connected here to the uh, to the internet to show you something. Uh, I'll just, I'll, um, I will, come on, come on, connect, there we go. Okay, good, I'll show you uh, a couple of slides. One of the most common objections that people have to this is my patients aren't asking for this, my patients aren't like that. And to make a long story short, it turns out that for every segment that you look at, uh, the, the, 
the, the disbelief disappears. For instance, one, one of the most activated patients in the world is a woman named Regina Holiday, who has no education beyond high school. Um, and in fact, if I can go to Susanna Fox is the woman, uh, the, the researcher that I mentioned uh, who, let's see, she just published last week a wonderful blog post. Oh, it's on the wrong screen, sorry. Uh, mobile social health care. It turns out that one of the most effective behavior change interventions that anybody has come up with yet is a simple texting thing that was done in Kenya. All right. Very low education level, uh, getting people to self-manage uh, uh, a chronic condition. So look into that. Uh, it, you know, the same, th this issue of, um, you know, I call it from psychology, cognitive dissonance. When you, you have a view of the world which is well thought out and matches your experience and then something comes along that doesn't match. All right, the mind tries to rationalize. Well, let's see, it, and if you've ever studied the, the, the field of shared decision making in medicine, Okay, at first, the shared decision making started with the discovery of what they now call practice variation. Tonsillectomies are 10 times more common in some parts of the United States, and it turns out other countries than in other parts. Uh, and so people initially said, well, my patients must be sicker. So then you look at the data and control for that, and it turns out, no, for the same level of sickness, you still do them 10 times more. Well, my patients are poorer. Well, my patients are less educated, and so on. It turns out that, yes, all those are factors, but even when you control for those, the variation still exists. Another great example, I, I often talk about the women's movement. This is a flyer, I got this from Facebook but then I Googled it and I found out it was valid. I get a lot of information off Facebook, um, but I always Google to check it. This is a flyer from 100 years ago on voting about whether to give women the vote, men voting on whether to give women the vote. And this said no. And look at one of the, one of the top reasons here. 90% of women aren't asking for it. Well, that's a good reason to say, no, you can't vote, because 90% of women aren't. And another one, even more fun, I love this reasoning, 80% of the women eligible are married, so they could only duplicate or cancel their husband's vote. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> but this is, this is cognitive dissonance. When new information, people, you know, and people always say, well, it's really hard to change culture. I don't want to, because it's hard to change culture. Well, there was a series of, of 45 old ads that went around Facebook a few months ago uh, that would not go down well today. Here's another one. They were all from the women's movement. Show her it's a man's world. There you go. The husband gets dressed for work, gets back in bed so the wife can kneel in a silk robe and serve him breakfast. Yes, Van Hughes and ties. Uh, that's, that's an older one from around 1950. Uh, this is from the disco era, the 1970s. Get ready for this. Keep her where she belongs. Really, naked, looking at your shoes. Wow, okay? And from around 1970 also, a Volkswagen ad. Sooner or later, your wife will drive home one of the best reasons to own a Volkswagen. A crumpled fender, all right? And look what the ad said. Women are soft and gentle, but they hit things. <laughs> yes, you have an opinion on this? Are you going to... <laughs> well, I have a bedrock myself, but just to touch upon this question. Yes. Uh, the microphone, please. I was happy to be in a meeting last week about personal cancer care, and Leroy Hood was there, which is also for the P4 movement. So yes, Leroy Hood. Yes. And he elaborated on how to connect to the patient, and it, of course that's a connection you have to make. But the uh, wisdom he, he, he said there was that you have to connect also to the family members, of course. Yes. And then it turns out that the best way to get into the system of the patient is to hit the mother taking care of her family. Of course, you need a mother then to to be present yet for prevention in healthcare that will be the target to go for the mother. So the, the opinion has changed over the years uh, uh, in respect to the role of the female Well, yes, I member. mean, so what did I say back here? 
all right? A pivotal force is the urge to care for our children, right? And on the, on the point of, um, of this ad, you know, the, uh, I testified in Washington when they were making the rules for the new, you know, we're now required to start using electronic medical record systems. And there was, there was an argument about should patients be allowed to look? Uh, and a big concern was that patients don't understand this stuff, the same way I didn't understand the word craniocaudal. And I said, you know, in 1953, my mother w uh, had three young children uh, and a traveling salesman, husband who was never home, she needed to learn to drive. And within six months, she backed into a telephone pole and put a dent in the fender, exactly like this sort of thing. I said, the truth is, until people gain experience at something, they're inexperienced. And it's a mistake to judge someone's potential by what they're able to do when they're new at it. And I said, the proof of this is that today, insurance statistics say that women have one-third fewer accidents than the men who used to make fun of them. You know, so I said the solution is not to keep people in the dark. The solution is, as that empowerment definition said, develop their capacity, train them to be more effective at it. And then on the subject of cancer patients, we have this question of who gets to say what quality is. This was an article in the, intern, uh, the Archives of Internal Medicine almost three years ago. Um, it, it's something that said electronic health records do not improve quality of care. Okay, they said there's no consistent association between these systems and better quality. All right, so this raises concerns about the ability of health IT to improve quality. But I looked at the definition. Their definition of quality was simply whether the doctor prescribed the wrong thing. Now, from the patient's point of view, that's not quality. Now, that's the minimum acceptable thing. In any other industry, the patient, the consumer, is the one who says what quality is. If you've ever been involved in Lean or Six Sigma or anything like that, you know that the definition of quality goes back to what the customer values. In medicine, though, we just say it's whether the doctor makes a mistake that that's good enough to qualify as, as quality. And here's a great example of this. Uh, this is something that actually happened in Nijmegen. Uh, an in vitro fertilization program had this crazy idea. They gave the patient couples a wiki and six months to talk to each other. Now, in this, cl in this clinic, by the way, the new patient brochure is created and managed by the other patients. The people who run the clinic say that they believe more in community and the patient perspective than they believe in authority. The question was, if we could do anything for you, what would you want? What would the top 10 things be? Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this American TV program called House MD, but you can, this very authoritative doctor, you can imagine his reaction to this. What, you're gonna let the patient say what they want? But the top things they asked for, Number one and number two was more attempts to achieve success at fertilization. That's no surprise. But the number three thing, if they could have anything, is they wanted empathy from the doctors, not just information. They wanted the doctor to understand their feelings. I visited this place. It is not a happy place. People who are there are there because their dreams are dying of ever having a baby. They want empathy. The number four thing, almost makes me cry every time I see it, separate waiting rooms for families who've become pregnant so that the ones who have, how much does that cost compared to more research, more treatments and so on, right? If the family, if the patient gets to define what, quali what is quality to them, um, and then, you know, simple things like more times to make an appointment, even, even in the evening. In the US, some leading hospital systems are completely recreating their clinics. There's a, there's a place where they've, they've developed a breast cancer building where you can go in in the morning, get your testing done, everything done, and walk out a few hours later instead of waiting a week or two to find out what the results are. What happens if you ask the people whose lives are at stake what they would value? This does not deny what doctors are good at. It adds to it. Um, another question? How are we doing? Well, we're, we're at 12.15, so. 
and I'm around for the rest of the day, obviously. And I'm also very easy to reach since I'm on the internet. So you know, go right ahead and contact me. Uh, yes. Uh, one question. Um, with regard to the information on the internet, um, uh, what we usually see is that patients who have um, uh, a negative uh, idea about a therapy or a, or a medicine, okay. they are usually more active on the internet than people who think it's okay or it's, and they are glad it, it helped. Um, so I always find it very difficult to find the, the information uh, in a balanced way. Um, yes. Uh, do you have some ideas about it? How Certainly. So in the book that you'll get, um, I, I, I wrote the book, but I asked my doctor to contribute some parts. And uh, so uh, in part three of the book, there is a page... Uh, there's, this is like one page advice sheet. So there's one thing is 10 things e-patients say. Uh, uh, and uh, by the way, uh, the, there is a Dutch version of it, an e-book uh, that's available. Uh, but they, there's 10 things e-patients say to be involved in their care, starting with, I like to understand as much as I can. Can I ask some questions? And the second, the next page after it is 10 things written by my doctor, 10 things doctors say that encourage patients to be involved. Then he has 10 things doctors say that discourage that. And then he has his advice for using the web for medical information. An important thing when you really get down deep into it is to realize that doctors as well as patients need to understand this. There is no single reliable source of information. No website, no journal article. Did you know that a large proportion of medical journal articles, the finding becomes less true as time goes by? There was an article written about this called the decline effect. And a big part of the reason for that, when I was in, before I was in college, right, I was taught that any good scientific experiment, if you repeat it, you'll get the same result. Most journal articles are never repeated by another lab. Ah, you know, I would like to see science funding shifted so that 10% of the funding goes to duplicating other studies. There's a big cultural problem, though, because any university researcher is not going to be interested in having their stuff tested, because if it turns out they were wrong, that's not good for their career. But anyway, so it turns out you know, nothing on the internet is reliable. And you know, the, again, same as with the other things, if somebody's not good at doing something, we should develop their ability. Susanna Fox, again, wrote that um, Googling is a sign of a patient wanting to be involved in their care. They're trying to find information. So my view of the medical practice of the future is that there will be somebody you can call and say, what do you think about this? So they can say, that's a good website or that's a bad one. Yes. So I would just like to say thanks, uh, Dave. Thank you. It was a real powerful presentation as it combines a personal journey, but also with insights in how to empower patients to become health consumers. And I really want to say... Clarity on the information in these yeah. kinds of aspects. This was really great. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And I want to say I've, I've been talking to people about this for a few years. Pursue this and you too will find out there's something real here. There's an advantage to understanding this. Okay. So before, let's thank Dave.